the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to be O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, um, a couple of people who don't know my history, but I've been preaching this gospel for enough years that I think maybe somebody else should do it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to leave it to the preacher in September to really pick up this gospel. And I'd like us to look at this collect. Hmm. You know, this isn't the first time I've done this, but the collect is really worthy of looking at closely. They're very carefully crafted prayers, some of which have huge long histories, some of which date from the most recent prayer book. Um, oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy. That would be enough, isn't it? <laughs> Whose glory it is always to have mercy. Always. When I watch a beheading on television, do I think God could be merciful to those people? I think that I'm being told this is what I'm supposed to believe. That God could even be merciful to the worst offender in the worst situation. And somebody even that has in some way harmed me. God could be merciful to the person who's been nasty, mean, and selfish and ruined my life. <laughs> Whose glory it is to always, always to have mercy. For be gracious to those who have gone astray from your ways. Now, whenever we read this kind of uh, statement, there's a couple of things that happen. It's not the way to talk exactly. But it sums up for us some things. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways. And our brains immediately think, that guy over there, and that guy over there, and that guy over there. <laughs> when we should be looking into ourselves. Now, I don't think that um, our sins are like a person who doesn't be ahead. I don't even think our sins are like Abraham's were. And I love the way Paul sums up Abraham in this epistle, because that's not the Abraham that's in the Old Testament, never having strayed from the ways. After the promise is given, a lot of things happen, including that he sort of gives up on the promise and has Ishmael by, the, by his um, concubine Hagar. You know, so maybe, this, maybe God wasn't quite right. It's got some other woman is going to have that baby of mine. And so, you know, things continually fall apart, and yet he continually returns to God. Continually returns to God. And I think that's the story of faith that the Old Testament is telling, is that constant return to God. Not that Abraham never strayed. You know, okay, you remember the other story where he's saying, well, if you want a prostitute, here's Sarah. <laughs> Uh, he did stray. And I think that that's part of why he's such an, an icon for us. Because he struggled. And well, that's what Paul is really saying. For us, he's a, real, he's a real icon for us. Because he was picked out of nothing. Out of nowhere. With no possibility of uh, success. You know, I, I think there's a fair number of gray heads here today. I'm not the only one that's retired. Our successes are for the most part behind us. For people who are very young, who haven't finished school yet, you're thinking about, what am I going to be a success in? And all of that planning and planning and planning. And that's the American way, right? Pursue what's successful. And make a success of it. And do it well and all that. Which is really good in a lot of ways. But it has been raised up fairly often to the level of an idol, isn't it? I'm successful. I have succeeded in this. I have done it. I am in control of my life. Bring them again with penitent hearts. The penitent hearts comes when we realize that we haven't done it for ourselves. I actually wanted to ask somebody. It's a name I can't pronounce necessarily. Simone Why? Thank you very much. <laughs> Somebody I've read and I haven't quote. Why should I be anxious? It's not up to me to think of my 
myself, it is up to me to think of God, and it is up to God to think of me. <laughs> Why should I be anxious? It's not up to me to think of myself, it is up to me to think of God, and it's up to God to think of me. That's the penitent heart. I should be thinking about God. I should be worrying about what God wants of me and how I stand in the light of God. That penitent heart is when I realize that I have gotten in the way of my own success. I have trampled on others while I was going along. And in this uh, season of Lent, some of you may be adding up some pretty interesting sins, but I don't know what they are. I don't think I've done anything altogether that interesting this year. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I say that we are all sort of gathered up in these different things. I turn on a light, right? And it's electrical production, which has all kinds of environmental concerns with it. I go and buy a new pair of shoes, or I buy food at the grocery store, and it has all kinds of concerns with it. You know, I'm, a, I'm also responsible for the person who is being paid less than the living wage, because I want to pay less for a pack of peas or corn. I'm also responsible for the, for the corporate greed, because I buy the products. So, my responsibility is in there. So, so in some ways, you know, we, we need to come to this. Those penitent hearts also have to be saying, you know, we're all in this together. And even the horrors of what's going on in the Middle East right now, maybe we have some hand in. You know, and how is, how is it that we have, have created that situation? Penitent hearts, knowing that what I create is not myself, but God creates me. Steadfast faith. Steadfast faith, that's Abraham, right? He strays over here, he strays over there, and yet he returns to faith in this Yahweh without any community, right? At this time, it's not like he learned it from somebody. It's something completely new and out of the blue, and he's steadfast. And that steadfast faith is everything about returning. It's not always about never straying. And, <clears throat> and hold fast to the unchangeable truth of your word. That's, a, that's the toughest phrase for me in this college. The truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your son. This, in case you don't know, this is kind of the the ending of all collects. Your son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God forever and ever. Um, so the collect kind of ends with unchangeable truth of your word. The unchangeable truth of your word. I don't know what that means. Except that, because everything that I experience changes. Everything that I experience changes. We did just get back last week, and I'm going to go next week to be with these grandbabies that we thought were never going to arrive. I, we did calculate. They have been trying for 12 years. They have tried everything known to humankind. And it was the third round of IVF, and they have these beautiful twins. To me, they're miracle babies. Something that could not have been foreseen when I was born, right? Nobody could have imagined kind of a, a treatment, if you will, and those people being able to be fulfilled with, with being parents with like they wanted to. Things do change. Barrenness does change. Okay? So I, everything that I know is change. Now, do you ever look at yourself in the mirror and say, what the heck happened? <laughs> 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 everything changes, right? Everything changes. So I don't, I have no idea what unchangeable truth is. And I'm going to stand here and say that till the end of time. I have no idea what unchangeable truth is. Except that it's embodied in God. 
in the Word of God, the person that we call Jesus Christ, in that Word, the, that's where our faith rests. And that's where Jesus, in this Gospel, is calling us to put our faith, right? In that unchangeable truth. So, okay, here is the Gospel. How many of you don't want to hear the take up the cross and follow me again? <laughs> it's been it's been very abused over time, hasn't it? Pick up their cross and follow me. For those who will save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. This is not losing your life for someone or something else. This is not losing your life for the program or the latest diet or your career or uh, getting an A in English. This is not any of those things. You will lose your life to God. Again, remember in what Simone, what? Say it again. Simone Bay. Bay. <laughs> That's why I don't remember it. It's like a, anyway. It's God who thinks us up. We don't think us up. God thinks us up. And if we can let go long enough to realize that it's not us that thinks us up, but God does. It's not us who creates us, but God does. In every way that counts. Remember, again, I, my background is science. I actually believe in uh, the science of ambition. <laughs> I think it's a good thing. But nothing here was not created by God. So all of my creativity, all of my intelligence, all of my ambition, all of that comes from God. It didn't come from me. Let's say it together. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways. Bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I have one other quote that I found in reading this week from Doc Hammerfield's markings. Give us a pure heart that we may see, a humble heart that we may hear thee, a heart of love that we may serve thee, a heart of faith that we may live thee, a heart of faith that we may live thee. Thou whom I do not know, but whose I am, thou whom I do not comprehend, but who hast dedicated me to my faith, thou.